Hi everyone, this is another episode of From the Lighthouse. I'm Stephanie and I'm here today um, once again with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Jeff Payne. Hi, Jeff. Um, so Jeff, being a romantic scholar, um, it has come today to talk to me about um, Shelley mm-hmm. um, because it is the 200th anniversary of the publication of his poem Ozymandias. Mm-hmm. So we thought that we would celebrate the publication of this wonderful poem by bringing Jeff in to tell us everything he knows about Shelley, which is possibly <laughs> going to be a little um, not safe for children. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> yes, we, we may need a, a censorship. We may need a, a parental <laughs> a, a, a advisory, parental advisory on, on, this, on, this one. on this episode. But I thought we'd start highbrow and then we can perhaps degenerate <laughs> from there. Um, Jeff, would you like to read the poem? I would. I, for I, us? I, I did think that um, probably, given that it's only a sonnet, mm. only a sonnet, that it is a wonderful sonnet. Yes. <laughs> um, but so short that yes. it might be a, a wonderful way of, uh, of introducing the subject because. Mm-hmm. Shelley's poetry is the thing that speaks largest about why we still remember (laughs) Shelley. Yes. So, Ozymandias. I met a traveller from an antic land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive. Stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Why, thank you, Why, thank Excellent, you. excellent reading. Um... <clears throat> A lovely, wonderful sonnet. What is what's it going is. on here? Well, this um, this sonnet for me is exemplary of many of the things that I love about romantic poetry, and they're the kinds of things that very often in the popular imagination get forgotten about the romantics. Um, in the popular imagination, the romantics are because of the the associations between romance and what we call romantic. There is an idea that a lot of the stuff is about emotions and about mm. emotionality and intense passion, and that's not absent no. from this particular poem. But it's not its central interest. Um, its central interest is, of course, power. Mm. Um, the effects of tyranny um and so it so it's a i suppose a reflection upon the nature of power and what it does um it's also a reflection upon the relation between the human and the natural world um and about the insignificance of individual human life in comparison to the larger sweeps of time. Mm. And, and, and all of those issues sp- strike directly, I suppose, to the heart of Shelley's core concerns throughout his, um, his, his oeuvre, he, he, over, over the course of his publishing life. He was always interested in social issues. He, he was one of those writers who... Um, had a very strong sense of an ideal world that might possibly be created. Um, he wasn't unskeptical about that idealism, but 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 he, critically, for a long time, he he was kind of painted as a as a as a very um, narrow Platonist mm. in terms of the the, the, the the conflict between the materiality of, of the existence of the world and a separate ideal world um, that we see reflections of mm. that influence and informs the world but it's not it, it, it's not entirely achievable but we we can get closer to the ideals of that world the more we study them and, and attempt to appropriate them um, I think Shelley, Shelley is is the uh, is a kind of figure who has an aspiration to recover that ideal world in some concrete sense, yeah. but is forever 
striving to find a way in which that might um, actuate itself. So this poem is, is 1818. Yes. What's going on at this time, both for Shelley and in the wider kind of context, okay. that feeds into this poem? So at this time, socially, mm. we are sitting at the end of the Napoleonic mm. period. Napoleon is finally defeated in 1815 at Waterloo. Um, 1814, there is the the half victory, and then we have the final defeat. The mm. final, de- uh, and and in the wake of Waterloo, we have a transition in the way in which England is operating during the 1790s and the first decade of the 1800s. Um, England had become very militaristic. It had become repressive, socially conservative. Um, There had been opportunity for governments to repress political dissent um, in the name of preserving national security, which they exploited to the full. Um, And... Shades of today? Shades of today. Mm. War on Terror. I mean, this was a war that went on, you know, really, you know, beginning with the the French Revolution in 1789 through till 1815. So Mm. we've got 25 years of constant warfare, more or less. Mm. Um, We've got um, a government that has been used to having things their own way. Um, But we've also now got a standing army that doesn't have very much to do Mm. Um, we have given the end of the war a whole raft of social issues that have been left on hold Mm. for a long period of time that people have been willing to put up with because of the war and Mm. because of their ability to subjugate their own individual desires to the social good. That argument kind of carried enough weight to get through to the end of the Napoleonic War. But following that, there is a strong agitation fermenting for political reform. People are hungry. There is not enough food. There are are draconian laws in place that um, regulate the prices of food in ways that are entirely advantageous to the merchants and the upper classes, which means that in times of um, poor harvests, Um, that there is not very much food around. Um, And so there is a lot of social unrest fermenting. Um, There is also, at the same time, these are the first... We're we're entering into the the main phase of the Industrial Revolution Mm. where um, there is more um, factory production of things, people being displaced from jobs, people dis- being displaced from their places of work. There's more and more enclosure of lands, which means that um, people are being t- taken out of the rural communities that they previously lived in and moved into cities or into other types of um, manual labour mm-hmm. that is not agricultural as it used to be. And so people don't know where they are. Um, because... The king at the time, George III, is suffering from a mental illness. Um, the, the apex of the system in its um, you know, ideally imagined form is missing uh, in action. The, the son who is meant to replace him, the regent, is widely hated for being a, um, he, he's seen as a morally corrupt um, licentious figure who who doesn't do anything to secure um, the good of the people, and at a time where there is a lot of poverty, a lot of hunger, what have you, the the regent becomes a figure of uh, who upon whom can co- be concentrated a, a lot of hatred, a lot of anger about the way in which um, the aristocracy in general mm. is is treating the lower classes. Well, he's living the, large while people so are he's starving. living large while yeah. people are literally starving in the streets. Mm. Um, that's kind of the the big picture. Shelley himself um, is in a very precarious social position. 
although it's a precarious social position entirely of his own making. <laughs> yes. So Percy Shelley is the grandson of Bish Shelley, who is a baronet, and his father, Sir Timothy, inherits the baronetcy. He himself is the eldest child. He is in line to inherit the baronetcy. Um, he has, during his childhood, a very luxurious um, childhood. He's sent to Eton College. He's sent to Oxford. Mm. It's at Ox- Oxford that things start to go wrong. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at Oxford, he, along with a friend of his, get together as undergraduates do and write something a bit naughty. Mm. Um, they write a, a tract that um, there is no God. Mm. It's an atheistic tract that there is no necessity for a God, um, that in fact God is doing harm and damage. Um, that kind of expression would be still controversial enough today from certain prominent figures in yeah. certain yeah. communities. I mean, we our society is more tolerant of atheism these days than what they were in those days. At that time... Um, even writing a piece like that was the kind of act that is going to get you in trouble. But Shelley doesn't do things by heart. He's no. a very idealistic young man. He's very um, he's imbued with a strong sense of self-importance and self-righteousness, which comes out of his e- very luxurious, e- privileged childhood. Right, yeah. privileged childhood. Yeah. He's just used to having everything his own way. He's got means. He's got everything. So he doesn't just send it to a printer, but he sends it to the heads of all the colleges at Oxford. He sends it to all the bishops in the church. (laughs) Right. So a pretty provocative action, right? The established church, it is the national church. Um, There have been religious tensions in England in the past where people have, where where kings have been executed because of Mm. the the antagonism over, you know, the, the, the need for bishops the idea of attacking God and the existence of God in this particular society um, to the very heads of the, the church, the princes of the church, um, the deans of the college who are also connected to the church, um, what have you, uh, is an action which is just um, incredible in its either bravery or stupidity, depending mm. on how you want to frame it, and people have read it both ways. Mm. Yes. And you yeah. can read and it, you, can, you know, there, yeah. there, there, there is an element of both. Mm. I don't think they need to be mutually exclu- exclusive. But to Shelley's surprise, he got kicked out of Oxford. Yeah. Now, it it speaks volumes of the man that he didn't see that coming. Yeah. Um, But he didn't. It really does seem to have really taken him by complete surprise that he would be expelled from Oxford. He considered universities, stupidly at his time, and maybe even today, I don't know, to be places where (laughs) intellectual thought was to be encouraged and freedom of thought was to be encouraged. And they weren't. No. Um, They absolutely weren't. The established um, universities in particular um, were notorious in those days for being um, places where you received a very conservative, Mm. narrow, well-defined Education, assuming you received any kind of education as well. They were also the domain of the aristocracy by and large, and many aristocrats who attended college merely went there to be given a degree without actually doing anything. Yeah. Um, Byron, for instance, at about the same time as Shelley, attends Cambridge, um, and the main thing that he does there is he sets up some very lavish rooms, he keeps a bear as a pet in the... <laughs> um, in the stables, and he drinks and and gambles and seduces young choristers. And he doesn't doesn't go to class. I mean, they they didn't exactly run classes in the same way. They had a tutor. They would be given a list of readings. But if you got a good tutor, you know, the list of readings wasn't particularly onerous. And um, you'd probably done most of that stuff anyway while you were at school. And so it was really just an an excuse to party for a few years before you went and assumed. They, They weren't. They didn't need to have um, particular skills in order to do whatever they were going to be doing in the future because they were going to inherit everything. So yeah. who cares? Um, who cares? Yeah. The, the younger sons who went were going to be set up in the church, but at the time, you know, you didn't really have to know very much to be <laughs> a, a, particularly if you were a, a aristocratic member of the, the, yeah. the church community, you would probably have yeah, a curate, curates yeah. and what have you to actually do the things like run a sermon or something mm. like that. So anyway, she- Shelley 
gets kicked out mm. of Oxford and it floors him. <clears throat> um, what's more, it creates a rift between him and his father. Um, his father is not happy and insists that he recant um, and renounce the publication, which Shelley, um, to his credit, refuses to do. Mm. I think it is to his credit. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. you know, there, there's a degree of stupidity in it, pig-headedness, but, mm. you know, he does... Be- he, he has written something that he actually truly believes mm. and he sees an injustice in the actions that are happening and he says, no, this is silly. And he stands, I'm not, behind, and he stands it. Yeah. behind it. Yeah. So he does refuse to recant and his father refuses to budge. So he's essentially reduced to a position where he has very limited financial resources. The problem for Shelley is that he can never actually come to the realisation of what those limited financial resources means. Mm. So he continues to live throughout his life as though he's going to have those financial resources at some time. Um, He continues to borrow money from various people to promise and give money to various people very generously. He's a very generous man in terms of borrowing and giving money. The problem is that he doesn't ever pay his bills. So he promises money to people grand sums of money for them to achieve particular projects but they never actually the money never eventuates um he falls in he doesn't actually fall in love with he meets a girl harris westbrook who he sees as being tyrannized by her father she's a she's a relatively respectable middle class girl um who is being forced to go to school by her father. (laughs) So terrible. Criminal action that it is. So Shelley elopes with her, takes her under his his wing, and despite the fact that he views marriage as a tyrannical institution of no value at all, he agrees to marry her. Mm. Um, Neither family is very happy about this. Um, They don't... They're not given a space to live. So they essentially become nomads going from place to place throughout the world. uh, Throughout the world, when I say throughout, throughout the English world. So in England to Wales to Ireland, back to Wales, back to Ireland and England in various, you know, journeys. Um, Setting up in various places and bringing in all of these experiments in in a kind of a social idealistic Mm. mode. Um, during the course of this time, (coughs) Shelley becomes acquainted with William Godwin, the philosopher, Mm -hmm. and the father of Mary Godwin, Mm -hmm. the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who is Godwin's wife. So a a, a girl with incredible pedigree in terms of Incredible So Shelley is very taken with Godwin Mm. as a philosophical thinker. Um, a libertarian a, 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 who has written about freedom of love and free spirit and about the tyranny of social the social systems yeah. that exist in the day and the need to liberate people from such tyrannies. And, and Shelley is completely um, uh, taken with God when he decides to, you know, to, to go and put himself at the feet of the master mm-hmm. and become his disciple and... Um, Agrees to take on all of Godwin's debts, which yeah. is substantial. Which is, yeah, many, yeah. Um, borrows large sums of money in order to be able to take on these debts. Now, in the course of his acquaintance with Godwin, he, of course, meets Mary and decides that he loves her, not Harriet. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> he is a advocate of freedom of love and believes, in fact, that it's immoral to live with somebody who you don't love in the context of man and wife, and so therefore abandons Harriet entirely, who has just had given birth to their second child, um, and elopes with Mary Shelley and Mary Shelley's half-sister, Jane, who changes her name to Claire. Um, They go to Europe, spend a couple of years between Europe and England, going backwards and forth, Wandering about. Wandering about. Meeting Lord Byron Byron. Mm -hmm. in 1816, where Shelley and Byron formed a very fast friendship that that, that lasted um, until um, Shelley's death. Um, But the... So this is where things start getting really complicated personally for Shelley, though, because Harriet, his wife, is 
entirely bereft. He invites Harriet to come with him <laughs> to the continent with Mary and live with them as though she's his sister yeah. while he bears with Mary. He's also having an affair with Claire yeah. at the same time as with Mary, although Byron is also having, having an affair, affair with, with Claire, Claire yeah. um, which, is, which produces an illegitimate daughter. And Byron doesn't really like Claire at all. And does everything to yeah. discourage her and tries to get rid. But he sleeps with her anyway and has a child with her, which becomes a, a really thorny... It becomes the, the kind of one sore point of contention between Byron and Shelley is mm. the, Byron's treatment of okay. of Ada. No, not Ada. Um, um, uh, Allegra. Allegra, mm. yes. <clears throat> so by 1817, Shelley has... Been back to England. He's sorry. So before before eighteen seventeen, um, Shelley Harriet Westbrook kills herself. Mm. Surprisingly enough, she didn't like this idea of hanging. She about didn't like with, the idea with, with Mary of Shelley hanging and about with yeah. Mary and Claire. She is reduced to a state of desperate poverty. Her family will have nothing to do with her. There's no money from Shelley's family to support anybody. Mm. Um, so Harriet is in increasingly desperate straits and decides in the end that the only way out is to to kill herself. Mary and Claire's other half-sister, Fanny Imlay, also kills herself because she also was in love with Shelley and can't bear the thought of being without him. So he, he, he's this figure who seems to have this in very magnetic personality. I don't know whether it speaks volumes about the paucity of men <laughs> during the period or the, something about the character of yeah. the, the man when he was there in front of you or something like that. But he did seem to have this um, effect on people to, you know, people who knew him um, re, re, either really took to him or really hated him. And Byron was a very similar kind mm. of character, very polarising. Um, so he's got two um, women who have killed themselves at the fact of his elopement. The one thing it does do is it means that he can marry Mary now officially because his former wife is dead. But his family will now have absolutely nothing to do with him. There is no chance of a of a settlement. Um, Shelley's father does agree to take on the management of the other two children, only under the proviso that Shelley himself has absolutely nothing to do with them, so the, the two older children. But Shelley is essentially left without any means for supporting himself or sustaining himself. And he's got a collection of children with Mary he's as got well. A, he's got a collection yeah. of children yeah. with Mary as well. Um, and so he decides that the only thing he can do is go to the continent where he falls in with, um, or he reconnects with the Hunts, mm. who he has also known in England. Now, the Hunts, Lee Hunt is another interesting character. He's um, well... He's, he's maybe best known these days as being the model for Harold Skimpole in Dickens's Bleak House. Mm. Um, himself, another one of these figures who, um, very idealistic politically, um, with very few practical, pragmatic skills, who <laughs> lived skills. entirely... For, <laughs> so he in, lived entirely upon the charity of other people yeah. um, throughout most of his life. He had been prosecuted for seditious libel and imprisoned, um, for having written um, pamphlets, published um, newspaper articles that were um, derogatory of the Prince Regent, and he was forced into a kind of political exile. So Shelley um, and Hunt set up this kind of circle, uh, political circle in Pisa in Italy, where they um, where, where they become fast friends. They 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 work and what have you. So Shelley in 1817 is just kind of at the beginning of this era of finally having decided that England is no longer a place where he can live. He still is intensely interested in the political system there. He still has, in the back of his mind, hopes that his father will cop the twig and he will inherit. Yeah. And there won't be... His father has instigated chancery suits to make that inheritance as complicated as possible. possible yeah. So it's not ever going to be re resolved any time soon. But Shelley has the, these kind of hopes. But at the same time, he's got no money to live on. And so he's in, he, he's in enormous amounts of debt for those days, several thousand pounds, which are the equivalent of several million dollars in, mm. in today's terms. He's, he's so it's serious. Seriously in debt. Yeah. Um, if he were in England, he would be locked up in debtor's prison. Mm. So he doesn't go to England. He lives in Italy. But again, he's, he's forever writing to 
friends and acquaintances for money and for requests. His children start getting sick. Yeah. They don't have enough money to live. His daughter Clara dies early in 1817. Um, William dies yeah. early in 1818. Um, so so um, at the time Ozymandias is written, is in the middle of this severe financial hardship, Shelley personally feeling oppressed socially. He's also got a very complicated domestic relationship with Mary, mm. um, where because Shelley believes in free love, he feels quite um, okay with having lots of mistresses and not particularly inclined to try and hide it from his Did he wife. try to talk her into having yes, affairs? Yes, he tried yeah. to talk her into having affairs with Byron and with ver- she wasn't various other people. Biting, she no. weren't into it. No. <laughs> but he kept saying, oh, it would be really intellectual. I mean, we didn't, so. we didn't mention the fact that at the point that they elope in... Um, in 1815, 15, yeah. Mary Shelley is 15 years yeah. old, yeah. and he is only 20. Yeah, something like 23. that. 23. Yeah, yeah 20, okay. So they're very young. They're very young. Yeah. Maybe 22. Mm. It might have been 1814 that they first went. I don't remember. I don't exactly. remember either. Yeah. But anyway, they're, they're very, very young. But Mary knows herself well enough. She is a very intellectually precocious young Mm. woman and she knows herself well enough. So she is strong in the face of Shelley's Mm. attempts to persuade her into doing things she don't want to do. And that causes conflict. So there's a lot of tension and conflict. Living in Italy at the time, Italy, like England, is in a state of political unrest, um, agitation for freedom from rule... Um, yeah, so Italy isn't a national entity as we know it today. It's a lot of smaller principalities and states um, which are variously under their own rule or under the rule of Turkish, uh, the, the Turkish Ottoman Empire. And so there is an agitation for um, political freedom or for the, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. So, you know, there, there, are, there are lots of um, very regional, regional yeah, yeah. Um, variations. And so Shelley finds himself living as an expatriate Brit in this community in Italy. He becomes involved with some of the political movements in Italy. Um, He's also very intellectually bound up to um, Byron and the other romantic uh, writers around them, Lee Hunt and the Lee Hunt Circle. And that's when you get that night that they do the ghost stories and then... Well, that's earlier. That's that's a bit earlier, 1816. That's a bit earlier, 1816 in Switzerland. Yeah, so that's when she... Yeah, yeah. She gets the idea to write Frankenstein. mm. Yeah. Mm. But but it still comes out of that same kind Mm. of, you know, sense of community. And, And, I mean, particularly... The younger generation of scholars had, a, and, and you know, there, there was Wordsworth and Coleridge and the other Lakers with the older generation. They had their kind of community, never an official designation that they just knew each other and admired each other's works and hated each other and <laughs> yeah. all that kind of stuff. But they, they, yeah. there was a lot of um, interaction. Shelley, amongst the the younger romantics, was the only one who continued to admire the older romantics. Um, through the period, even though he um, repudiated their politics. Because they, they became increasingly conservative. They became increasingly... Yeah. I mean, the older generation of romantics were children, were, 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 were teenagers at the time of the French Revolution and thoroughly taken with the yeah. ideas of the French Revolution and thoroughly disillusioned by the actuality yeah. of what took place during the terror and during the, the 1790s and the de, um, the devolution as they saw it into the Republic and under Napoleon, the, the Empire under Napoleon. Mm. Um, and so they had repudiated a lot of those idealistic politics that they held as younger people. Um, and so the younger generation of romantics... Um, being young people couldn't understand the idea of maturation or change in in perspective, and so they felt very angry and, uh, and strongly angry about the, the what they saw as the abandonment of the the liberal cause by those writers. Um, Shelley was able to look beyond that at the poetry and appreciate it for its artistic endeavour mm. to an extent that Byron would never admit that he did. Byron was actually more admiring than what he ever would have consciously admitted. 
Um, but 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 you can see in his poems that there is um, as much homage and the satires that he produces on the the um, the older romantics again demonstrates an intimate knowledge of their yeah. works even as at the same time as he um, is sending them up. Um, but so Shelley, you know, even just the the choice of the sonnet form yeah. um, in terms of this is continuing on this renewed interest in um, more formulaic. Um, regularized standard verse forms and attempting to um, revolutionize them, to make them new, to make them different, to bring them into conversation with the interests of um, the, the political ideologies of the day. In a lot of Shelley's poetry, what we have, and we, we have this in Ozymandias, to get back to where, to get where back, we began yeah. a long time ago now, um, with Ozymandias... It's 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 that conversation between the the individual living in the here and now and the 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 evidence of the past, the evidence of the old world and the way in which that can inform and bring new knowledge or help us to understand the way things really are. Mm. So the function of the remains of Ozymandias, who, which is the Greek name for Ramesses II, um, an Egyptian pharaoh who was uh, widely known as a very despotic ruler, um, that becomes a really useful emblem for, uh, you know, look at this human, remains a man, um, in the face of you know, he had this immense power to build these massive monuments. The the, the utterance on, on the pedestal, look on my works, ye mighty in despair, appears to have the original intent of look at the might of these works and understand how insignificant you are in mm. relation to them because I am far more mightier than you. But it becomes heavily ironised in the poem mm. because of the, the fact that such might is nothing in the face of the, the encroachment of time the, the natural forces of the desert overrunning the... the, mm. the so even this mighty area. ruler is reduced to rubble. Is reduced to rubble. And so it becomes mm. a, a mechanism for offering commentary. You know, here is a, an old verse form talking about old things and we're bringing them into the present day and we're talking about things that are happening right now. We're talking about these high and mighty empires and um, people living in England and Italy mm. and in Austria and mm. Turkey who are um, who are ruling despotically yeah. as Shelley sees it and the implication clearly is you know this is what is going to happen this is the fate of all human mm. power and might um, so it, it, it's kind of running it together now in a lot of Shelley's other poems there is always this political conversation Shelley himself is a really significant figure in terms of leftist political movements throughout the 19th century. Yeah. Right? He's, mm. um, he, he is highly influential on Marx and Engels, if yeah. no one else. Yeah. <laughs> and the British Chartist movement used some of Shelley's poems as kind of anthemic um, mm. refrains for, for them to, to galvanise um, support, I suppose. So there's this overt interest in, in, in real politics laid over the top of artistic experimentation, mm. laid over the top of engagement with conflict and turmoil in individual and personal life. And there's a, there's a real dedication, though, in this poem, even though the, the human is destroyed and reduced to rubble, the... What is there still is the is the is the um, remains of the art yes. that can prompt that thought, that kind of contemplation, and and it is through then also the sonnet that you can even you can think even about. even in its fragmented yeah, and exactly. ruined form and fragment fragmentation and and ruin is also an important yeah. um, artistic interest yeah. of, of the romantics, the romantics yeah. in general. So even the remains of this artwork that testified to the kind of um, the sands of time, I suppose, destroying it, um, even the, the, the contemplation of just the rubble is enough to make you think about 
about what happens to mm. power, what happened. And that act of mm. contemplation yeah. in itself becomes therefore a political act. Yes. Exactly. I mean, po- Shelley, in a, in, in a far more forceful, concrete way in the defence of poetry, an essay that he wrote a, f- a couple of years after this, um, claimed a very high status for poets. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Thank you, Steph. That's yeah. exactly <laughs> the line, right? Yeah. He viewed... And, and so po- by poetry, what he means is imaginative writers, Peter, mm. people who don't just deal with the facts mm. of, of of the world. So he, that, he it's not just the like, prosaic writers, you know, journalists or pamphleteers or something. That's yeah. right. But but he's not also he's also not just talking about people who write poetry. Oh, yeah. He he means people who are engaged in sincere artistic pursuits. Mm. Um. Those are the people, the people who engage imaginatively, who with the remains of what has gone before, there's a strong emphasis in Shelley's conception of poetry and what it is and does, in knowledge of the past. One needs to be aware of the Mm. past, what has gone before, a careful, close study of the philosophers and of the scientists and so not only of the past, but also of the... Shelley was really interested in all current... Um, you know, he, he's, he is Victor Frankenstein. Mm, yeah, but he was a very, in, and he was a very kind of dedicated reader. Very dedicated yeah. reader. Mm. He, he read all the Everything, latest journals. Yeah. And, and, you know, in it's, it's often said that, you know, in, in this period, we don't have the, the strict separation of disciplines mm. that we are used to today. So if you, mm. um, if you are a gentleman, you are expected to be across all of the latest de- developments in natural history. Mm. And in poetry, and in philosophy, biology, chemistry, and in biology yeah. and chemistry, which you see everything. in in Frankenstein, right? Yeah, right. So the, you know, the, the, this is the kind of figure that he is, and he's very interested in. So, what happened in the past? Mm. What exists in the in that past stuff that is of value and that continues to resonate today? And how can that be brought into conversation with things that are happening and things that are important now? Not only in the big world, but also in in the personal world. So then, also, how does the person? And this is another overwhelming overwhelming interest of the the romantics is how does the personal extend to the political? So Wordsworth's Prelude, which is the great epic of the Romantic Age, is a poem about the de- the the individual's development into the self as the poet. So Wordsworth mm. biographical poetry yeah. poem about himself becoming a poet mm. in his life. This is the, the the great overwhelming interest of the Romantic Age. And and Shelley is interested in that sense in terms of, you know, how can interest in the individual's life, personal circumstances and what have you feed into an interest in, in what else is, is going on. And, I mean, again, that's not strongly in this poem, but just that opening sentence, I met a traveller in an antique land. It's a very mundane opening to a, mm. to a poem, right? It's, it's, it's a, you know, I met, hey, this guy. I met this guy who'd been somewhere. Yeah, and he told right? me. Right, and he like, told me some stuff. It's like what I did on my summer holidays, right. you know. And it, that, As that's, a narrative, yeah. it's really mundane. And, and when I lecture on this in first year, at, um, in, a, in, a, in a first year program, I kind of do a real disservice to the poem by reducing it to a narrative, mm. and we we engage it in a, in, a, in a with it in a kind of narrative way. I have a really awful one sentence summary of the poem, um, <laughs> which is very bland, deliberately bland and mm. devoid of detail, in order to to make some points about you yeah. know narrative elements and what have you. But you know, to extend on that, you know what the, what this, this poem does is it it juxtaposes this mundane beginning with the grand mm. um, historical element. Right? And it's it, and it's a, such a beautiful encapsulation of that um, belief in the past feeding into the present because mm. we are using the ancient, very ancient past to feed into um, our contemplation, political contemplation of despotism. And also you, you have the turning of the instruments of oppression mm. upon the oppressors themselves. That's right. Right. I, it, 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 time tyrannizes over. Time tyrannizes yeah. over, and yet, so this becomes Marxian Marx's version of history, mm. right? Um, the, the 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 oppressed will always overpower overpower the oppressors, and the 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 tools of repression will become the instruments of their own destruction, mm. right? The, the, this in Ozymandias is exactly the same mechanism that Marx kind of instills into his 
um, ideology, which mm. becomes so influential for 20th century artists and writers in history, and what yeah. have you in history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Shelley is really interested in that, in, in that notion as well of being able to use... So the, the carving mm. takes on a new life when recontextualised and brought into conversation in a different way. Um, in a different place in a different time it completely shifts its meaning yeah. and so the audience are invited to recognise that pattern of being able to take something old and, and, and bring to it something new I feel like packaging it up and sending it to Donald Trump <laughs> yeah well look what time will do to you and your power t- mm. fake news mm. yeah that's right <laughs> hashtag fake news um Yesterday you told me an interesting story about mm. Shelley that is, is kind of related to all of this um, stuff and kind of encapsulates, I think, even though it's really funny and that's why I want you to tell it, I think it, it, it encapsulates the, the nexus between Shelley's like, actual convictions and politics that we see is very um, laudable mm. and having his heart in the right place, but the kind of bumbling way he sometimes... Yeah, so this about it. Th- this story that I told you, it comes from a period of, I think it's 1814. So prior to this. So prior yeah. to this. Um, and Shelley has is on his travels through England with Harriet Westbrook and Harriet's sister Eliza, who he also hates. Um, so this is prior to Mary Shelley. Prior to Mary Shelley. Um, and they fetch up in a place called Tin Ear Allet which is a, a Welsh name meaning under the hill. Mm-hmm. It's very atmospheric. Yeah. <clears throat> it is very, very atmospheric. Ferric. Um, and what this, it, it's a place where um, some very well-meaning people had decided to set up an embankment project to reclaim land from the ocean, mm-hmm. to allow poor people to have access to land, which they were becoming increasingly spare, um, so that they could grow food for themselves. So it's a very, very noble, project. noble project, idealistic, ultimately ill-fated, mm-hmm. um, little chance of actual success given the limitations of the, the landscape and what have you. But Shelley comes to this place and he just falls in love with the project and thinks that it's wonderful. He has, not long before this, been in Ireland. And at the time as throughout much of the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th Mm. centuries, Ireland is a place where there is a great deal of social unrest, um, resistance to English rule, um, and Shelley goes to Ireland to agitate for reform, emancipation of Catholics, um, better conditions for the peasantry and the working classes what have you. He puts lots of people's noses out of joint um, and essentially has to flee the country to avoid being locked up. This is a, a, a fairly typical pattern. Running theme in Running Shelley's theme life. in Shelley's life, yeah. right. He publishes a lot of um, proto-unionistic pamphlets at the mm. time. Um, he gets involved with the, the proto- prototypical working unions there and therefore puts the noses of a lot of powerful industrialists and landholders and what have you in the local area out of joint. He gets away from there. He comes to Wales. He he washes up at this project, and with deliberate, enthu- you know, with, with typical enthusiasm, he throws himself wholeheartedly into the project. He somehow ingratiates himself with the guy who is the head of the project. He becomes the 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 chief secretary for generating funds for the project. For and he starts writing off letters to all of the power pe- powerful people nearby. Um, Lecturing, he, he, we're talking about a twenty-year-old uh, man, young he's man, just been who's just out of been uni. turfed out of university, been to Ireland, been had turfed to flee, out of turfed Ireland. out of Ireland. Um, he has been disinherited and disowned by his family, um, but he just has this magnetic personality and yeah. this ability to um, convince the people who he is around that he he is there. He is the answer to all their prayers and all their dreams. And so he inserts himself into the project. He becomes integral to it. He promises lavish sums of money 
from himself and says that he's going to generate all this extra money for, to, from the local magnates. He starts writing off letters to all of them in a very lecturing, hectoring, antagonistic tone to which, surprisingly, they take issue. Mm-hmm. Um, he does generate funds. He's not entirely unsuccessful. He has pieces published in the, the press and what have you. He was, he was a great pamphleteer. He's very good at, at dashing off prose writing. In fact, William God, Godwin... Um, insulted Shelley's, you know, he, he um, when when Shelley got Godwin to read through Leon and Sithna, um prior to his publication, um, Godwin um, told him he shouldn't publish it and that his review of Godwin's own novel that had just been published was a far better production and Shelley couldn't, <laughs> like, it was just, you know... But Godwin was quite perceptive because Shelley was a very good... Um, polemical prose writing. Yeah, he was really yeah. good at, at writing that kind of, of stuff and quickly and for publication. So, he, you know, he, he did a lot in terms of raising the profile of the project and what have you. But in, in the process, he um, manages to piss off almost everybody who's powerful in the local area to the extent that one of them decides to send somebody along to kill him. <laughs> so Shelley is... At home one night, he he's had a servant who, of his who has been locked up for political agitation himself, <laughs> who has just been freed from jail and has just come home from jail. And he, Shelley and the servant are sitting up late that night with um, Eliza and Harriet in the drawing room, and somebody shoots through the <laughs> the, the bedroom uh, through the living room window um, at Shelley. Well, no, uh, sorry. At this stage, he comes into the room and he threatens Shelley with a pistol, but Shelley himself has two pistols loaded next to him because he's clearly... He's always got... Right. Well, the, the, people argue about what is actually happening in this yeah. circumstance. Some people believe that the whole thing is a hallucination that Shelley had, had under the, the influence <laughs> of some kind of drug. <laughs> there seems to be sufficient evidence that something, something did happened. actually happen to discount that theory fairly uh, comfortably. Mm. Um, but, but actually, that's the story that his friends put out closer to the time, you know, after Shelley died when, when they were trying to tidy his life up a little bit to make him a little bit more palatable because mm. during his lifetime he was social, mm. uh, he was untouchable. He was an atheist, he was an immoral character, he was a bankrupt, he, mm. you know, th- th- he had everything social against him and he, he couldn't um, be mentioned in polite society. Mm. Um, anyway... The, the 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 individual comes in and threatens him with a pistol. Shelley shoots at the guy and hits him in either the arm or the leg. The exact location of the hitting is unresolved. Um, <laughs> and the man leaves saying that he's going to come back and take his revenge. Right, But so essentially when he comes in and threatens him and the, the family, it's essentially, you know, you've got to get out of town or things are going to go horribly mm. for you. Shelley shoots him. He vows revenge. The women go to bed, they're in a state of panic, but Shelley sends them to, to bed and, and he decides that he and he's also in a state of panic um, and the servant, everybody's a little bit panicked, as you would be after somebody's mm, come somebody into your house and, and, and threatened to shoot you. Um, somebody takes another shot at Shelley through the window of the house and misses. Um, goes through his dressing gown that he's wearing. Oh, wow. The bullet passes through the gown that he's wearing and enters the wainscot. <laughs> this is so 19th century, yeah. Um, at which point, Shelley, the very next day, well, I think that, that very night, they up sticks and they remove to the house of the manager of the project, who is also one of the people who has sub... Has, who has behind closed doors been sending stuff to other people saying, get this guy, get rid of this guy, yeah. somehow we've got to get rid I've of him. I've got to get rid of this guy. have <laughs> got to get rid away. of this guy, he's a real pain, etc. Yeah. Um, so he goes and stays there and then they they, they flee back to Ireland. So they get the hell uh, again, out of Dodge. They get the hell out of Dodge City. Mm. And, and you know, again, as you, as you said you know, at the beginning, you know, when we were starting off from the this, this story, I think that it's really, you know, just so, it speaks so strongly to yeah. to the nature of the man that he can be so politically idealistic and yet so unaware of the consequences of the actions yeah. that he takes. Because I'm totally on his side politically. I'm like, this sounds like a great project. It should be funded. Let's protect poor people. Let's give them jobs and right. money. Great. Right. Progressive, wonderful. Unions, also great. And what's more, the kinds of people who is pissing off and antagonising are exactly the kind of people who are 
awful and yes. he should be and he should be agitated agitated yeah. and but the unawareness of the i suppose the fact that they have this power that that, that, that will enable them to take action of the kind that they do. Mm. Um, and he's seemingly being unprepared. People postulate that the reasons that he had the pistols was not because he was expecting an attack on himself, but that he was worried that people might come after the servant who had just been released from jail and that government agents might be going to come along and, mm. and make trouble because this servant was being taken back into the house. It wasn't that he actually anticipated any attack from the, the local on magnates on him. Yeah. And the fact but see, that laudable was, again. He's protecting his servant. Laudable in that he's protecting his servant, but unaware. And yeah. it's, a, it's, I mean, for me, Shelley as a figure is, I mean, he, he's, he's a type who serves still as a rich vein of satirical humour. So he always reminds... When when the young ones were big in the late Mm. 80s and early 90s, Rick Miles, people's poet, right, always seemed to be a heavy satire of Shelley. Um, There's a comedy series on Netflix at the moment, Cuckoo, where where a a young girl brings back this American boyfriend. She goes to on her gap year to Thailand and, and comes back with an American boyfriend who sees himself as a philosopher guru. And he's, he's got all of these high-minded ideas, but he's also completely clueless. Mm. Um, and the father Shelley. in, the, in the, mm. the situation is aghast and is doing all these things to try and get rid of it. It's very funny. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, a great British yeah. humour. But again, it's a very Shellian kind of figure of this, you know, very young man yeah. with a very um, it's difficult with Shelley to say exaggerated view of his intellectual capacities because Shelley was a very bright man. Like, you know, he, yeah. you, you can't accuse him of being a dummy. No. He thought very deeply. He was widely read. Um, he engaged really seriously in that mm. process of artistic endeavour. Of course, he had the capacity to do it um, in terms of, like, he didn't have the money, but he, he had the ability to convince people he would have the money eventually to keep on mm. lending him more and more money in order to be able to do it sufficiently that, that that he was able to spend the time. And he was also able to neglect all of his social duties or social responsibilities. See, with all the good stuff that we say about his political idealism and what have you, a lot of the people who suffered at the hand of the unpaid bills are, of course, the tradesmen and yeah, workmen right. who exactly. supply him with all of the, the essentials of everyday life. And Every place that he leaves, yeah. he leaves with all of his bills unpaid. And they apply to his father to pay them, and his father refuses to pay them. But see, um, this is where I think his privilege comes in, because he's right. grown up in, you know, in entire privilege, and he's never had to contemplate all of this. And so that gives him this, this absolute confidence that he's just going to get away with things. Every, everything will be paid for eventually. Yeah, eventually. it's all just going to work out in the end. He's never had to sweat on it. He's never had to worry. And yes, he does later um, because he, he you know, is constantly poor. But because he has that inbuilt confidence that comes from this in, entirely privileged background, he never has to think about, or he thinks he doesn't have to think about all these things. He just blunder through and everything will turn out all right in the end because that's the pattern of his of his childhood. I mean, he has to life. continually negotiate loans. So he, yeah. he can't entirely not think about it. He does, yeah. he, he does, and he does occasionally pay bills. But he doesn't, but he's always <laughs> confident that it's going to work out. Right, right. And doesn't and it, have that awareness of like, oh, I'm really And, and, and you know, again, it's, it's this idealism about the future and the idea yeah. that it's all going to work out in an idealised yeah. kind of sense at the end. That I'm helping to bring about. Mm. Yeah. So he's, he's really laudable in one sense, but also terrible in <laughs> Mm. And his and his mm. treatment of women is something that I just cannot. Yeah, well, I mean, so that's another thing that we haven't yeah. really touched upon. But yes, his 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 treatment of women, you know, again, it's it's not he's not entirely alone in his um, bad treatment of women at the time. And, and one day we're going to do our podcast time. on who was the worst romantic. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And it's going to be a really <laughs> close, close run competition. Yes. <laughs> um, and and you know, as with Byron, mm. like Shelley and Byron seem to be the clan, the, the standout mm. front runners, right? You know, oh, the you, worst you can't romantic, get the yeah. worst of uh, in terms of personal character. Um, and yet, with both men, the evidence of the people who knew them well mm. suggests that there was something about them that was, you know, so th- th- they were both fiercely loyal friends who had a great deal of care for 
uh, their servants, mm. for the people around them. Byron less so than Shelley. Shelley was, you know, really, you know, had that egalitarian philosophical idealism that saw that people should be treated equally. Mm. Um, and so his treatment of women devolves from his unwillingness to play the social games that mm. were expected. And because of that, he becomes a figure who seems to provide an idea of liberation for women from mm. the strictures of a highly regimented society. In other times, at other times, we've been talking about Jane Austen and the way that she is working over this issue of mm. um, the, 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 the way in which women are so um, carefully regulated to the point that they have so little room to move. Well, Shelley's response is in a way, or you know, Shelley seems to offer an avenue, a, 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 mm. a new position for women to move. They don't have to be married in order to express love. Um, they don't... That, that, that children should be cared for, and Shelley was a, a, a caring-ish mm. father. He was ineffectual. He, he was better provide. than Byron. He was better than Byron, and in fact he cared for Byron's, Byron's children, chi yeah. child when Byron refused to do so. Um... But the fact was that he, as always, was completely too optimistic about the way in which the, the social effects of what would, or how many people would get behind and would be, would be able to accept the liberties and licenses mm. that they were taking with social decorum. Yeah, so he, he was destroying Mary Shelley's reputation irrecoverably. Mm. And Claire Claremont's as well. And all of the women that he slept with. And he had no perception that that was destroying them. No. Well, and in fact, you know, so he himself play, places no value on such reputations. So for him, it's not Yeah, it's anything. not an issue. But for them, it's an issue. But for them, it's an issue. And yeah. particularly once they're out of his circle, and especially once he dies. Uh, yeah. Mary, um, Mary Shelley's got a very long life after he, after he dies to, to get on. You know? Right. Mm. And it's not until very near the end when her son mm. finally does inherit Herit, the Shelley... Yeah. Um, um, baronetcy and the estates and what have you that there's any kind of financial security for her and until mm. that point of time she's um, living on her wits and mm. you, you know so there's a way in which thank God because what might have happened to the works that we have of hers yeah. if that weren't, weren't there and what yeah. might have happened to Shelley's poetry because her she, 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 she collated the, the, the complete work she preserved his reputation at a time uh, during the period where he was unmentionable, mm -hmm. um, to the extent that he that Shelley became so profoundly influential on Romantic writers, you know, like Browning, you mm -hmm. know, who, who himself is one of those really mm -hmm. awkward yeah. figures to treat to deal with in terms of mm. relations to women and yeah. But I like that he was so. I, I think there's a nice little kind of irony that we might leave it um, with today because we've completely run out of time. But um, I like that he was so terrible to women and kind of destroyed their reputation. But in the end, it was a woman who maintained his, his mm. literary legacy. And we have mm. Shelley today because of the efforts of Mary Shelley. Mm. So mm. maybe she got the last laugh after all. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeff. That Thank was absolutely Jeff. fascinating. And that story, which I didn't know about, about um, Shelley being shot out through a window, is one I will... He did a little sketch. Up. Oh, did he? I, yeah, he, he, he's got the. He drew a sketch of the the figure that tried, and the, this is one of the pieces of evidence that people often bring in to think it was hallucination because it's in, it, it's a it's a cartoonish kind of <laughs> ghoulish figure waving, you know, oh, guns and what have you through. We'll the, have to get that and put it in the show notes yeah, so people yeah. can have a look. That's <laughs> that's amazing. I love that story so much. So thank you for bringing that. Um, that was wonderful. Um, so this has been another episode of From the Lighthouse. If um, listeners could please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, that would be immensely helpful. Thank you to those who have already done so. It's been really, really wonderful hearing your lovely feedback. Um, we'll see you again in a week, and thank you once again, Jeff. No worries. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Bye.